the topic I was given was the, the management of uh, surgical management of myocardial bridges. If the surgical management of anomalous coronary is controversial, this is probably even more so with a you know, distinct lack of evidence or data to help guide our decisions and, and uh, what we should be doing to take care of particularly kids with this problem, which is uh, most of our focus here. I have no disclosures. You know, I'm not here to talk about pathophysiology or diagnosis. Uh, Many other experts uh, that know much more about this than I do. But for the surgeon who's trying to commit himself to this uh, operation or this treatment, you know, you'd like to have some uh, evidence or data that you can sink your teeth into to feel comfortable about taking a child to the operating room uh, for a... uh, for a surgical procedure, and it's just not intuitive uh, for the simple-minded surgeon that myocardial bridges should be uh, pathophysiologic. As uh, others have pointed out, most of the coronary blood flow is is during diastole, and the myocardial bridge uh, should, uh, theoretically at least, only create a problem in systole. We know that uh, from the uh, measurement or calculation of FFR that it does affect flow and, uh, and velocity in diastole also, but some have come up with this theory that the, the real problem is probably uh, more related to local septal ischemia and perhaps due to a venturi effect from the increased velocity in the uh, main coronary artery or anterior descending coronary artery creating septal steel. Now, whether that's real or not, I don't know, but this doesn't give the surgeon much um, much to sink his teeth into. And so there's a fair amount of discomfort taking one of these children to the operating room with um, performing a relatively rare operation. None of us does this operation with any frequency. And uh, performing a procedure where we really don't understand its efficacy. So if we are going to treat a patient with a myocardial bridge, there's obviously medical management. You've heard about that. Stenting, at least in children, we feel like is a no-no. I think we have trouble convincing our adult colleagues of that. But uh, in bypass grafting has its problems, and most people in the pediatric world would consider unroofing or supraarterial myotomy with or without bypass as sort of the standard treatment. Uh, The problem with stenting, as you've heard, is that these stents are uh, within the myocardial bridge and they're prone to fracture and therefore not a durable solution. Also, they're prone to instant stenosis, which uh, could require future procedures. And at least, uh, I know this hasn't been written about, but in in my mind, I would theorize that uh, you could potentially threaten some of the septal perforators from placing a stent in that area. Coronary bypass grafting doesn't address that that hypothetical um, concern about local septal steel, and there's uh, always this concern about graft failure secondary to uh, competitive coronary arterial flow in diastole. This is a paper or a picture I've shown here before, so you, you may be familiar with this. This is actually a case report from a coronary bypass graft, an internal thoracic a graft that uh, was used to treat a patient with anomalous aortic origin of the coronary artery, but very similar phenomenon. And this is a, a coronary injection, and it shows retrograde flow up the internal thoracic artery. So these uh, arteries without fixed stenoses, whether it's due to an anomalous aortic origin of the coronary artery or a myocardial bridge, uh, don't respond well to the grafts and are not a durable solution. Superarterial myotomy or un- unroofing, but very little uh, information about it, particularly in children. What we do have uh, suggests that it's safe and it's effective. Um, it can be formed with or without bypass and myocardial arrest. There's a potential for a minimally invasive approach, particularly as you uh, gain more experience with it. The potential complications are uh, obviously injury of the coronary artery, which you want to avoid at all cost bleeding, uh, and ventricular aneurysm. You might ask, how would you get a <clears throat> ventricular aneurysm with uh, uh, unroofing a small amount of muscle? This is a patient that I recently operated on, and the, uh, the bridged coronary artery is right here, and this is the right ventricular outflow tract. And so you can see that 
uh, just a millimeter away from the coronary artery and the muscle that you're going to be incising is a, uh, the ventricular cavity. And if you, if you breach the uh, right ventricular endocardium, you've got a problem because it's difficult to control that without, uh, without compromising flow in the coronary artery. Uh, this is the experience that Dr. Rogers just recently uh, mentioned, the largest uh, experience with pediatric supraarterial myotomy uh, that we know of. Again, 14 patients all had uh, significant abnormalities in their uh, FFR. Their first patients were uh, done with bypass, and the last five have, uh, as I understand, been done without cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, none of their patients had any complications, suggesting uh, it can be done safely. And all their patients, as he demonstrated, reported resolution of their symptoms. This is a, a CT scan of a patient who was a teenager and had a symptomatic myocardial bridge picked up on the CT scan. He had uh, positive provocative uh, testing and ultimately underwent uh, surgery. I just wanted to point out the, um, the bridge right here. This is the anterior descending coronary artery, the last diagonal branch. And I'm gonna show you a, a intraoperative photo of this and just how accurate CT is. There's this, this shoulder uh, proximally of the bridge and then it tapers distally and the intraoperative um, uh, correlate is, is perfect. These CT scans are phenomenally accurate in describing the anatomy. Uh, obviously we like uh, others are performing catheterization in, in all patients prior to uh, uh, supra uh, arterial myotomy. Uh, this is the cath in the same patient. The uh, LAD here, you can see the septal perforators coming off the LAD. This is the bridged segment, uh, the distal uh, or the last diagonal branch here uh, coming off. The, uh, obviously, you know, we do IVUS and FFR uh, functional testing to determine indication for procedure, but for me, the cath is the uh, best tool to plan the operation. All of this uh, in this area is covered by epicardial fat. And what the surgeon is looking for are these diagonals to identify uh, where the bridge might be. Uh, and uh, the, the proximal LAD up here is usually up behind the main pulmonary artery and very difficult to get to for the surgeon. And so what the surgeon is trying to do is, is identify the epicardial part of the LAD here by this diagonal and then work backwards uh, to do the unroofing or the arteriotomy. I think I have a, uh, a picture of that here. So this is a patient who's on bypass. Uh, the heart's arrested. The head is to your left, obviously. We've identified the LAD and uh, we're working through the fat there to, uh, to find the epicardial LAD distal to that last diagonal that we identified. Uh, there's a large coronary vein uh, right there that I'm trying to preserve. And then here we're just working under the bridge between the coronary artery, developing a plane there so that that muscle can be um, resected. Our preference has been uh, for unroofing. My personal preference is to use bypass and myocardial rest. Uh, I, I don't feel like TEE is helpful for this operation. Uh, in addition to just unroofing the coronary artery, you need to assure that the artery is free laterally as well. Um, there's um, obviously you want to avoid breaching the right ventricular endocardium. Other forms of bleeding you can deal with pretty well, but that is uh, that's pretty uh, tough to deal with. Uh, I try to assure that the length of the unroofed segment correlates with that we'll, uh, that we've seen on the CT. Again, all of this anatomy is buried in fat and um, surrounded by other veins and arteries and and uh, there's a tendency not to be aggressive, and so you want to make sure that, that the operation you've done is completely effective. Uh, you need to uh, ask your anesthesiologist to sort of stand down. You know, they want to give all sorts of medic medicines that they think would help the uh, 
coronary arteries. You don't need nitroglycerin, aspirin, heparin, beta blockade, any of that. I suppose theoretically if a patient had coronary vasospasm postoperatively, a calcium channel blocker would be the right drug, but uh, typically we don't, we don't uh, need any sort of uh, cardiac pharmacology. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.